I guess there might be a thousand different ways to approach a sermon based on Revelation 20, 1 through 6. If you didn't get the pun intended in that opening statement, I hope you soon will. This passage, Revelation 20, has probably stirred as much religious controversy and debate and confusion as any in all the New Testament. And I certainly don't intend to uh, attempt to set all that straight this morning. In fact, I'd just like to stay out of it. Our purpose in approaching this controversial passage is to look at the fifth blessing of the apocalypse, the fifth beatitude of the seven that are found in this last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. The blessing comes in verse 6 of the 20th chapter, and we'll draw most of our lesson from the blessing, but we do need to set the blessing, I think, in its context, so let's read and reflect a bit on this passage that has inspired so many sermons and books and doctrines and systems of thought. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, I would assume that uh, you notice there in those verses the repeated uh, re references to a period of time, of course, a thousand years, five times in that phrase, in that, in that passage of six verses, five times that phrase occurs, and so based on that, down through the centuries of interpretation of this passage, people have focused on the idea of the millennium, the thousand years, and when it would be, and, and, and how it would function, and what the significance of it would be. And so people have sort of divided themselves into premillennialists and postmillennialists and amillennialists and on and on and on to for seemingly uh, a thousand different options and how sad that is how sad what a distraction from the point I was thinking this week, wondering what John thinks. The one who saw this vision first and then wrote it down. What he thinks about um, what has, has come from what he recorded. Remember that the book of Revelation is a vision first. Uh, it is an apocalypse and we, we took time to define that as we started out in this series. An apocalypse is a revealing, an unveiling of truth 
through symbols and pictures and things that are meant to make an impression on those who hear it, those who read it. Who were those first ones to, to hear it and to read it? Well, they were Christians. They were followers of Jesus and they were being heavily persecuted because of that. They were being threatened in their first century world by the authorities in that world. They lived in the Roman Empire at a time when not only was it common to worship idols, idol, idols were everywhere, it was rampant uh, to worship idols, and, and really anybody who wouldn't bow down to those idols and render sacrifice to those idols in that culture uh, were considered not only strange, weird, but also unpatriotic, because this is what you did in Rome, you see. And so they were disloyal to the empire. But also the emperor of Rome himself claimed to be a god, worthy of worship. And in fact, at, I think by the time Revelation is, is written down, uh, it is uh, the fact that the emperor insisted on being worshipped. And there were temples built in honor of the emperor where you would go and offer sacrifice and that kind of thing. If you didn't bow the knee to the emperor, offer a prayer or sacrifice at the local temple of the emperor, you might well lose everything, including your head your life. And so God gives John, who by the way is in exile on a remote island because he refused to quit preaching that, that Jesus, not the emperor, was God and Lord. God gives John this vision, tells him to write it down for these poor persecuted believers to encourage them and to tell them to hold on and stay faithful despite everything that's being thrown at them and to tell them that in the end God wins and and that means that in the end they win if they stay with Jesus if they stay with Jesus. So all the strange pictures and symbols that John sees and he writes down are designed to communicate that truth to these people and indeed to us all these years later. We're still supposed to get that message. That's the message we're supposed to get from this book. That's what we need to know to benefit from Revelation 20, verses 1 through 6. And in fact, that's about all you need to know. So with that in mind, what happens here? John, in his vision, sees an angel come down from heaven. He's got two things in his hand. He has a key and he has a chain. With the chain... He's going to bind someone up, and with the key, he's going to lock that same person up. Who's that person? Well, that's the one thing that John is very, very specific about in this passage. He doesn't want us to miss who the person is getting bound and chained. He doesn't want there to be any confusion about the identity of this individual he's named in four different ways right all right so he's called the dragon he's called that ancient serpent he's called the devil and satan his identity is clear it is that great opponent of god that enemy of jesus and all those who follow jesus now if you go back to the closing verses of the previous chapter, chapter 19, two of the other great enemies of God throughout the course of this vision, uh, and 
the enemies not only of God, but of God's people, um, the beast and the false prophet are captured at the end of chapter 19, and they're cast into their place of final doom, which is described as a lake that burns with fire and sulfur. Now in chapter 20, it's Satan's turn. Satan is seized by the angel, he's bound with a great chain, and he's cast into a pit which is locked up. And he's kept there for a long period of time, represented in the vision, of course, by this term, a thousand years. Now just a little side note here. Satan is a spiritual being, right? Shake your head this way. Okay? I'm not saying a good spiritual being, but he's a spiritual being. Can a spiritual being be chained up with a physical chain? Or locked up in a physical place? Of course not. So the chain is a symbol, right? You understand that. It's something that's expressing a spiritual truth. Does that make sense? So why then would anyone say that the thousand years is a literal period of time in the same sense when, when the chain is clearly a symbol? It's, it's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? What's the message of the vision? The great enemy of God, that terrible opponent of Jesus and all those who love Jesus, Satan, is defeated. He is a limited and ultimately defeated foe. He is under God's control. God has him chained up for as long as he wants him chained up. And there is nothing that that snake, that dragon, can do about it. You think the people in John's day needed to hear that message, what they were going through? Sure they did. And I think we need to hear it. We live in a world where it seems like Satan and his allies are winning at every turn. Everywhere we look, we live in a world full of lies and horrendous sin and an awful violence. And all those things are the things that, that the great dragon loves. We need to know that even so, Satan is limited. And he is, in fact, defeated. Satan, according to Revelation, is sort of like a, a, a wild, vicious dog tied to a wire that's strung between two trees. He looks ferocious. He makes a lot of noise. You walk past him, he might scare you to death. But then you look up and you see he can't reach you. He is tied, you see, he's bound. He can only go so far. Now, is he still dangerous? Just step within his range and find out. Sure, he's still dangerous. But not if you stay in step with Jesus. Not if you're walking with Jesus. One word from Jesus, and that dog tucks his tail between his legs and whimpers like a whipped pup, which he is. Now, if you go back to... Revelation 12, there's another scene there in the vision uh, that John recorded and 
In, in Revelation 12, Satan is pictured as being kicked out of heaven and, and thrown down to the earth. And he's sort of been on earth causing mayhem ever since Revelation chapter 12. And here in Revelation 20, his time of causing mayhem and, and persecuting people and deceiving people upon the earth has come to an end. And he's, he's locked up in the pit and then eventually over in verse 10, which we didn't read, John sees the devil cast into that lake of fire and sulfur where it says he will be tormented day and night forever. That's where he ends up. Satan is a loser. Why would anybody want to sign up with a loser? I don't understand it. And so, with the great enemy defeated and locked up, in verses 4, 5, and 6, John gets a picture of what the world would be like without Satan in it. And let me tell you, it looks totally different than the world we currently live in, doesn't it? It's a world now where righteousness reigns. It's a world where the godly, instead of being hurt and laughed at and mocked, are exalted. It's a world where those who are loyal to God are not killed, but instead they live. And those who lost their lives because they refused to bow the knee to Satan or his minions, they are raised to new life and they reign with Christ. It's what the world looks like when Satan's put away. Please don't miss this part, friend. Here's our blessing today. The fifth blessing of the apocalypse, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Again, don't get distracted by the thousand years like 90% of the religious world around us is. It's just meant to picture a significant period of time. Can I illustrate that for you for a minute? Give you something to think about. Remember this verse from the Psalms? There's part of a verse from the Psalms where, where God says, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. Remember that? That's in Psalm 50 and, and verse 10. God says, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. Now think about that. Does that mean that the cattle on hill 1001 doesn't, or 1002, or 3010? Does that mean those cattle don't belong to God? Of course not. It's a figure of speech, isn't it? It means all the cattle belong to God. So it is with a thousand years, you see. And I'll just leave it there. What's the fifth blessing? Blessed are those who experience the resurrection. Blessed are those who are raised. The righteous who are raised to new life in Christ Jesus, as he promised to all who would follow him, he promised them this. Blessed are they. Why? Well, many reasons, no doubt, but notice here it says they're blessed because the second death has no power over them. The second death. You mean one death is not enough? We have to go through two? Well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. 
John says, if you get the first resurrection, you don't get the second death. What's that mean? The first death is physical. I'm sorry to say, but we're all going to experience that. One out of one does. Now, I know that, that the world we live in does everything it can to avoid it. Our culture tries to forestall aging and death and accidents at all costs. Why? Because I think deep down, even though they would deny it, I think deep down they know what comes next. They know. It's created into them to know. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and then comes the judgment. A big part of the message of this passage, and really all the book of Revelation, and in fact all of the New Testament, is this. We don't need to fear so much this first death. We, we really don't. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ said this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. There is no reason for a follower of Jesus to fear physical death. But those who reject Jesus, reject the Savior, have every reason to fear physical death. And there is no reason for the follower of Jesus to fear the second death. That is, eternal separation from God in a lake of fire and sulfur with the devil and his allies. That's the second death. And that's what this blessing says. Blessed is the one raised up by Jesus. Over him the second death has no power. Those who have been born again in Jesus enjoy this blessing. Think about it this, this way this morning as we close. If you are only born once, that is physically born to your mother and father, if that is the only birth you ever experience, then you will have to die twice. Once physically and once spiritually. And as bad as you might think the first death is, the second death is far, far worse. But if you are born twice, once to your mom and dad physically, and then also reborn in God, in Christ Jesus spiritually, then you'll only have to die once. Only once. The second death, the spiritual one, has no power over you. Satan has no power over you. In short, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. We get to choose. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. I hope every person under the sound of my voice this morning has been born twice. Because you can walk out of here with no fear whatsoever. Man has nothing over you. Satan has nothing over you. The greatest part of your life is ahead of you. 
If you're not sure about that, make a change today. This is the invitation. This is your opportunity to respond to it. Let us stand and sing.